to talk to you about two videos in YouTube that I saw yesterday. Actually, there were two shorts, very, you know, just a few seconds. But there were two videos that impressed me and moved me terribly. And I actually went to bed last night with these two videos in mind. They affected me profoundly. One of them was of a Palestinian boy who was uh, pushing a cart, like a garden cart, you know, with two huge containers uh, full of water. And he, he was just, he must have been about, I don't know, 10, 9, 10, something like that. And he was pushing this cart with these two huge containers of water. And the person who's filming him is asking him questions, stopped him and asked him a few questions. Obviously, they are speaking in Arabic, but there is the English translation there. And he says, uh, he asked him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm carrying water. And, uh, and he says, um, he's asked, so, so where did you get the water? Where did you get it? And he said, oh, over there, far away. Where He says, where the Egyptians are. I don't know exactly what he was referring to, but obviously quite far away. These, these were, uh, you know, in, in Gaza, obviously. And uh, he asked him a few more questions. So you're going to drink a lot of water. It's for everybody, he says, but you should have seen the, the, uh, the face of the child huge beautiful smile saying yeah I'm, I'm carrying water for everybody it was like you know little boy seeing Santa Claus and I'm carrying water for a really happy beautiful innocent smile and that shook me a little bit because then the uh, this person this interviewer actually pans across where he because he was almost there and you see hundreds probably thousands of people um, really, you know, one next to, to each other, some with tents, some some sleeping on the ground. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, kind of horrible. And, uh, and this little boy saying, I'm carrying water for everybody. So that was just about 30 seconds. And the, the smile of the child actually moved me. And then there was another one, the opposite. And this is probably some of you have seen it because I think it has gone viral, as they say nowadays. But uh, it's an, uh, an Israeli soldier. Um, he has he's filming himself, and he has someone. This is an adult male sitting down naked with just his underpants, really, and he is cutting him. He's actually torturing him and cutting him like that. And he's actually uh, filming, recording himself. And uh, in the little short that I saw, there was n there is no um, there is no uh, language. There is there is nothing. No one is saying anything. He's just it's just a picture there. Anyway, so my goodness, so this sort of I just I just uh, couldn't believe it. So I actually went to bed last night with this two videos uh, in mind and uh, anyway so this morning <laughs> this morning as I am having my my coffee I go to my regular sources of uh, information and uh, I see an article in uh, Unheard um, Unheard is a, is a journal it's a magazine I used to subscribe to them. I I I stopped. I stopped during. I think it was during the uh, COVID or something. I did. I stopped. But for some reason, they keep sending. You know, as they do to to your email, to remind you to sign up again and renew your subscription and so on. And I actually clicked on an article this time. And the article was, um, let, let, let me share it with you, because this provoked some ideas in my mind. And this article is um, 
The Twilight of the Boomers. Britain feels frailer by the day. And it is regarding the fact that uh, His Majesty the King is, uh, has uh, cancer. And um, I thought that it was just, well, not just, but uh, prostate uh, cancer and that was uh, benign or something like that. But after that, they found that he has uh, cancer and they didn't explain to us, not that I am aware of what type of cancer it is, but it's besides the prostate. So anyway, this article is by... I will just read you one or two paragraphs, don't worry, I, I, I won't read you the whole thing, but um, it's thinking about, um, okay, so I gave you the title, which is The Twilight of the Boomers, the baby boom generation after the war. Yeah, the king is 75, I'm 73, so I'm thinking, oh, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <laughs> so I'll just um, I'll just read you uh, two two paragraphs. God save the king. The oh, by the way, did I tell you who is it by? Is Mary Harrington, who is a contributing editor at Unheard. Unheard, not heard as in here, but heard as in flock. Unheard. Uh, and uh, it says, God save the king. The announcement yesterday that King Charles is receiving treatment for cancer has sent another tremor through a Britain that feels frailer by the day. And yet this reminder of our king's frailty at 75 also stands for, for a broader transformation now afoot the Boomerdangmerang, or Twilight of the Baby Boomers. In Old Norse mythology, Ragnarok, translated by the German composer Richard Wagner as Gotterdangmerang, or Twilight of the Gods, is a time of cruel weather, moral chaos, and monsters, ri monsters rising from all points of the compass. Mountains will fall, the seas will rise, and the world serpent will come ashore as the gods clash in one final world-ending battle. But there is hope. This fateful time for ancient Germanic legend is a period both of terrible destruction and also of renewal. The Gotthard Dameronk may see Valhalla aflame, but in its aftermath the world will be rebuilt anew. Wagner used this motive as a backdrop for the final opera in his four-part ring cycle, an adaptation of an old Germanic myth first performed in 1876. It premiered just a few years after the fateful 1871 Union of Germany, a transformation that tipped the first geopolitical domino that would culminate in the cataclysm of two world wars. Uh, yes, the, um, this is about the... Um, when, when she talks about the 1871 reunification of Germany, um, the uh, the German Empire uh, was um, okay founded in 1871 in the wake of I, I looked this up in the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. It was uh, in, in, the, in the wake of three short successful wars by the North German state of Prussia. Within seven years, within a seven year span, Denmark, the Habsburg monarchy, and France had been defeated or practically eliminated, really. The empire had its origin not in an upsurge of nationalist, nationalistic feeling for the masses, from the masses, but through a traditional cabinet diplomacy and agreement by the leaders of 
uh, the states in the North German Federation, led by Prussia, which occupied more than three-fifths of the area of Germany and three-fifths of the population, and which remained the dominant force in the empire until it collapsed at the end of World War I. And uh, she continues, living through the era from the Ring Cycle to Yalta after the Second World War, must have felt itself like a kind of Gotterdammer. Certainly the first generation born after its 1945 resolution were determined to build a wholly new world amid the ruins of the old. A demographic bulge group conceived and born amid the relief, reunion and rebuilding that consumed Europe after the two wars. The boomers, that generation, threw out the old sexual codes, dismissed pre-war European culture as stuffy and square, and scorned anything that smacked of nationalism, patriotism, or old high European culture as dangerously Hitlerish. In place of all that, they dreamed of a new sunlit Valhalla's freed from the dark gods of industrialized wartime destruction. destruction. And she goes on for a while and then he, she says, in her 2021 book, Boomers, Helen Andrews argues that in each case, this generation from Steve Jobs to Camille Paglia and Aaron Sorkin set out to liberate us, but what they passed on to their children was worse than what they had inherited. And uh, these arguments will be familiar to anyone of my age and younger who looks askance at the generation that benefited from free university education and affordable housing and has since presided over an era, era, era <laughs> in which both have become something more like a Ponzi schemes. Today, the university system, the boomers bequeath us, is a monolithically left-wing and increasingly academic, academically flaccid visa factory. Housing, meanwhile, is a piggy bank for those who have and a pipe dream for the rest. Anyway, it, um, she, it's a very interesting article and uh, she, she goes on. And... Uh, why am I bringing these two together? Because not long ago, it just seems that everything fits in with what I'm reading and watching sometimes. Everything comes together. And I remembered an interview I saw a few days ago with uh, John Ray, who is a uh, political philosopher. Um, I think he's retired and he used to be at the London School of Economics. And uh, he's written many books, a very prolific writer. Uh, and the last one, or they're interviewing him. I forgot who was interviewing him, otherwise I would tell you, but I forgot. Um, Dusk of Western Liberalism, and that is the name of the book. And he talks about, he starts talking about the this world, the post-industrial world. And he says that he grew up is about my age in the uh, a little bit older perhaps he grew up in right after the second world war in a very very working class class english community in the north i forgot the name of the city where he was uh, he he grew up but anyway very very working class in the north and uh, he refers to it as um the society at that time was um, a very, uh, he says, a very strong, very tightly knit, knit working class community in the 1950s. Um, he says, bef they didn't refer to them as a community, <laughs> that is before people refer to themselves and their groups as communities. Uh, he says there was uh, good and bad. Uh, 
yes, it was restrictive in the sense that there were moral norms and ways of uh, behaving that, uh, you, you know, you had to go along with that and so on. There were common norms. Uh, so in that, in that sense, it could be a little bit restrictive uh, in today's world. He says uh, there was a lot of poverty, material deprivation, and he goes and explains, you know, about um, rationing and the, uh, you know, uh, outside toilets, and uh, the, the people were poor, they were living in, po in poverty. And then the Labour government came and changed all that, changed a lot of uh, things, and he said, of course, we all supported those changes at the time. He says, but those very, um, very close-knit communities, uh, the streets were demolished and people uh, were sent to living in housing states, affordable housing. Um, the uh, Obviously, everything around you, the material, the physical world, and, uh, you know, that improved tremendously. And, of course, everyone agreed with it. Uh, um, this, uh, but you see, what happened was that before, there is good and bad. You see, he's he's explaining that before, the the streets were multi generational. In a little bit of a way, even matriarchal, although people would not agree with that now. But uh, matriarchal, and and he said, and everyone knew each other when we were. Sit circumstances improved and we were moved to housing states and so on little by little he says you began to see graffiti you began to see street crime you began to see a little bit of a chaos um, individualism rather than the, the, uh, the community norms developing and he's going to he's going to talk about this. This is something that he has uh, written about in in other books too. And uh, this is something that interests him, John Ray, and, and talking about the author. Uh, now he says, of course there were advancements there, but great advances are often associated also with great losses. Can we at least agree with that? That when we speak of progress in one area, uh, it's not 100% good necessarily. There are sort of things that you have changed and left behind that were also good. And what was then, what changed? What was lost? He said was irreplaceable uh, because it doesn't take a lot a long time to uh, pull things down to destroy things but it does take a long time to recreate that if indeed it is possible at all and he says in a in civilization in culture uh, when you're talking about that, when societies disappear, it takes much, much longer to recreate them, if, if indeed you can recreate them at all. In other words, our roots. You cannot just sort of restart straight away, go back straight away, because these values are embedded in human beings. And once the human beings are gone, they're gone. They're not human beings are not like library books that you can go back and recreate it. Uh, you you will not find them in the cloud as it were. So that whole way of life, uh, he's, he's, he says, uh, disappeared. Life got better, yes, materially, but um, we have to remember, he says, that uh, life, uh, you know, that all life had good things, bad things, but good things too. The good things were the solidarity, the absence of crime, the trust, the open doors. 
And then he says something about the word populism. It's a long interview, so I'm just skipping. But he says uh, about populism that we hear so much nowadays, um, you know, in political terms. And he says this term is used by liberals to describe liberals in a, not the liberal party in England necessarily, not just them, but liberals in the sort of American way. Yeah. Uh, it's used by liberals to describe the blowback that their policies have created. This is the main point in his book. The fact that those who have made the changes in society in the last 30 years still don't see the indirect consequences of what they have created. Um, the reindustrialization of society, for example, the taking of jobs elsewhere, the decentralization of, of, of society, it was because they thought of it in market terms, in terms of efficiency. Okay, so uh, you move the factories elsewhere because uh, the wages are lower or whatever the reason might be. So. Um, they, they think of it only in terms of efficiency. He says, but of course, human beings are not markets. Um, in the past, in the past, they, there were institutions in our society that were not wholly driven solely at any rate by market forces. Um, but this, he calls it hyper-liberalism, he referred is is wokeism, I suppose. Uh, everything is market driven. Their policies are supposed to be efficient. They're efficient, but efficient. But they are. He says the problem is that they are applied also to other spheres of life, and that is going to have consequences. And those who have suffered and were displaced by these very efficient policies, market forces, those people, they complain, they're not happy, they're not satisfied with their lot as, as life is at the moment, but nevertheless they're treated with contempt uh, as if they were, you know, retrogrades or deplorables, yes. Uh, people who is not worth listening to. And his point is, these leaders do not seem to understand that it is their policies that brought about this unrest and this unhappiness and this sense of abandonment and loss. And they seem to, since they do not understand it, they, they seem to be asking, well, what is this? Where, where did it come from? <laughs> they don't understand it. Um, the, the, the madness here, the contempt for people who voted for, you know, let's, we don't need to go back to that, Brexit, Trump, you know the, the score. Okay, is that the, the, the contempt for these people is that they do not see, the leaders do not see, even now, that it is the indirect consequence of their own policies. This is what they call populism, contemptuously. And so, because they don't understand it, they double down. And since this lack of trust uh, does not disappear, but indeed it seems to be increasing, then they have to not only double down, but start using more authoritarian methods of censure and so on. But this uh, dislocated communities, someone has actually referred to these people as non-persons, can you believe? Well, these disposable for, uh, uh, former persons, not non-persons, former persons, which is about the same really, but these disposable former persons that they have created, alas, still 
What they seem to have forgotten also is that these people also have the vote, which is really a weapon that they use to badger the people that they had done this to them. In other words, that vote is actually the voice of the voiceless. Very interesting his his writings, John Ray. Okay, so what am I going what am I going with all this? You know, these videos and this interview. Because it all came together wars, the king with cancer, my own generation obviously perhaps being the next one to go, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, so all these things together, that's fine, okay. But the question in my mind um, lingers. This is what uh, I'm asking myself. What will the world be like for my children and my grandchildren? And because I, I think you can see that we are at a crossroads. Yeah, we are. We are. So I'm going back to the two videos. And that is, I know there are always shades of grey, but in terms of directions, it seem, direction, it seems that, you know, on the one hand, to, to, to be able to understand it and to put it perhaps the, the two extremes as these two videos are, on the one hand we have the moral depravity of the Israeli soldier recording himself while he's torturing another human being, humiliating another human being naked, yeah, um, and with his hands uh, tied up, <laughs> okay, that's one direction, and the other direction is that child, the Palestinian child, with his beautiful, innocent smile, so happy, yeah, I'm going to take water for everybody. And who is suffering more at this point? Obvious, obviously the little boy. And, and yet he's the hopeful one, the happy one. How is this possible? And so, which direction? We don't know. But let us hope in the direction of the little boy. Let us hope that um, the human spirit and people's moral conscience, that inner voice will end up speaking louder than our revengeful appetites, I don't know what to call them. Anyway, that, that uh, life will triumph over death and good over evil. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to, if you have enjoyed it, please give me a like there to help the channel and subscribe if you can. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.